Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, CMI School of Christ session today. You, uh, this will be available at night to you, uh, always available at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. But I'm recording it early, as I normally do, and uh, out here, beautiful day today and uh, not very hot and not too humid and uh, it's not raining today, so... I wanted to sit out here at the fire pit and <clears throat> figured that we could do this here. And uh, so hope you hope this is okay. Hope the wind doesn't bother us too bad. It's been blowing a little, but not too bad. So uh, I think it shouldn't interfere in our lesson. So let's get started. We are looking at, and you'll move a little bit because of this desk thing I have set up on my chair. What we're doing is we're still looking at Romans, and we've been in Romans chapter 8 for some time now, and we are studying uh, particular parts. In our last time together, we dealt with the spirit of bondage, the spirit of adoption, and I hope that that clarified some things for you. It has in my own heart, this reality of it going back and our examination of um, Galatians three and four and the, uh, the all of the things that are said from the middle to the end of chapter three and how it relates to chapter four and seeing who who the child is being referred in those uh, in those verses it's very important that we understand that uh, because it it gives a sense of certainty a sense of security to a believer which is which is what the gospel should do. The gospel should give a sense of certainty to those who are in Christ. I mean, how many times does Paul say, you are complete in him, blessed with all spiritual blessings, that in him we have come to uh, the goal. Uh, the, Colossians says that, the, the end of it, the, that in the King James, it says that we present every man perfect in Christ. That means those who are complete are come to the, complete goal or the intention of God from the very start. That's the reality that we are dealing with here. Uh, let me make sure my volume's up. Yeah. But that's the reality we're dealing with. That's the reality of the gospel. That's the nature of the gospel is to present something that is absolute, that is real, that is perfect, that God in his sovereignty and his power uh, wrought in for us and now in us who are, who are believers a complete work a sufficient work and that work is embodied and personified in Christ himself dwelling in the soul living in us so we dealt with that you can go back to that last uh, uh, episode and see how we dealt with uh, the spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption. But I'm not going to rehash that. Um, but I am going to read these verses, and I'm going to read the verses that deal with that in Romans 8, and then we're going to move on a little. Just another verse, basically, is what we'll cover today. But that verse is something that's very important, very crucial that we understand what is being said here because this is where Paul begins to, under, to, to, to present to the church, to those to whom he's writing, about the Spirit's work with regard to this great salvation, how the Spirit deals with our soul with regard to what we have received. And we're going to talk about that. So let's turn. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. We dealt with all of that, the fear that comes with it and in the last session. But you have received. Here it is. You have. This is something you have received. The spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Again, referring or paralleled in Galatians 4, where we are uh, 
partakers of the spirit of adoption that's in us crying out, Abba, Father. It is a transaction and a continual relationship that is ongoing due to the work of the spirit, due to the ongoing continuance of the spirit. And when I say the spirit, I mean the spirit of Christ, the spirit of uh the spirit of truth, the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life. That's all the same. It's Christ himself, Christ in you, by his spirit, living in you, working in you, and establishing in you a relationship with God that is unhindered by anything else. No force, no power can hinder what God by his spirit has wrought. I want you to understand that. This is as... This has everything to do with sovereignty, and we're going to deal with sovereignty, I think, in our next uh, session together. If you want to go ahead and look at it, it's on the podcast, my podcast, the Satisfy God podcast. You can listen to that, and you can see there is a episode. I can't remember what number it is. It may be 19 or 20, but there's one called Your God Reigns or Our God Reigns, and it's salvation in the light of sovereignty. Sovereignty is an element that is missing in so many, in so many uh, people's understanding. It's not missing if we are born again. There is a sovereignty that has determined, and, and we read that in Romans 5, but there is a sovereignty that has determined the soul's state of being or relationship with God. Yet, in our ignorance, we attempt, or let's say it this way, in our ignorance, we believe that every misstep, every mistake, every wrong move, any little thing can uproot the sovereignty of Christ within. We believe that the Christian experience is just one, one thing after another that either has the possibility or the potential to overrule and override the sovereignty of Christ who lives in us. And that is a foolish statement. That is a foolish thought, but that is propagated by most people who say they preach the gospel. No, they don't. The gospel is direct. It will, will, it, you see it in that session. We'll talk about it next class. The, the, the gospel itself is inseparably linked to the reality of the sovereignty of Christ, our King, the sovereignty of the one who reigns in us. We've read it already in these Roman classes, but I had to go back because it just struck me as I was going through the transcripts and looking at it, because I'm going through transcripts to write a book on this Romans series. But what drew me and i'm having to write an entire chapter just on this fact is the very end of romans 5 talks about where sin did rule or reign as king this is the weiss translation that even so and much more so grace now reigns in king as king bringing eternal life what a what a reality that is the gospel, and it is that sovereignty that is missing in most people's understanding of salvation. Therefore, we believe every little thing we do, think, say, act, any action taken or non-action taken has the potential to kick him off the throne and overrule his power and sovereignty with regard to our soul. And if that is your understanding of salvation, then you have a woefully ignorant heart. And that heart needs to have the truth revealed because the truth himself already abides there. The soul needs to see the one who reigns and the one who rules and the one who sits upon the throne 
so that that soul can live in the restful tranquility that comes in the seeing of this man because it is seeing the restful tranquility that our soul possesses as those who now abide in the Sabbath of God himself. We're not going to get off on that. We'll deal with that for the next class. However, we do want to look at these classes or these verses. Now, verse 16 in Romans 8, the Spirit himself, or itself, as King James says, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be, we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We'll talk about that later. We won't get to that in this class. Now, this is what I want us to look at. This is what I want us to talk about. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. that We are the sons of God. Now, what is that talking about? Because are the children of God, it says in the King James. And this this relates to the to the verses that's coming a couple of verses down and i have it here and we can we can read it but i don't want us to get too far off the point verse 18 i reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory being revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of god listen to this now the earnest expectation of the creature. And we're going to look at the creature that was made subject to vanity. That's the creature he's talking about. All men, all mankind, especially with reference to the Jew first, because they were subject to vanity through the law, not because they were willing to be, but by, by the one who did subject them, but he subjected them in a hope in expectation of a reality that was coming. What is that? The reality, he says, now are we the children of God. Now are we the sons of God. And this is the reality upon the basis of which the Spirit works. And the Spirit is at work in our soul, confirming in us the fact that we are sons of God. And here's, the, here's a trick. I call it the trick. Why? Because it is a trick. It's a it's a manipulation trick. We love to separate things, create levels. We love to do that. Preachers love to do that because it allows us to put somebody in direct dependence upon our presentation, upon our message, so that we can give them steps to to, to graduate from one level to another. So they have unfortunately taken these words in this same chapter and divided them up into almost dispensational segments. But let's not say dispensational, let's say uh, transactional. Uh, because this transaction brings this, this transaction, and you graduate from one to the other by achievement and, and qualification. They talk about children of God in this same chapter, and then they'll say sons of God. And most will say, well, the children of God are those ignorant ones that have no understanding. They're children of God. They're children. The real thing we want to get to, however, is to be sons. If you look the word children up, it can also be called sons. Yes, there are different words used at different times, but it's not because Paul was attempting to say, the Spirit's going to show you you're a bunch of babies, but what we're really wanting you to graduate to is to be sons. No. No. It's just words he uses to say it he uses different terminologies and i'm talking about here (laughs) 
All right, I'm not going to get off on it. So, Paul here, again, we have to keep in the forefront of our mind something very important. I'm going to go back to this. I'm not going to get off. As we approach these verses that we're coming to, verses that have been so misunderstood because they have been pushed off into the future, but the majority of these verses, not exactly these, but the ones previous, but we have to say they're all joined together. These are not Paul talking about right now and then suddenly changing to talking about three, two, three thousand years later that this will be so. No, he's he's presenting something true because of the fact that we are in Christ and that we are partakers of the righteousness of the law fulfilled within us. He's 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 bringing that we're. This is the portion of the letter, Paul, uh, letter where Paul is emphatically stating the salvation that has affected a, a fulfilled righteousness within those who believe and that has brought freedom from the previous state of bondage to sin and death. While it is new in its possession, and my, by that I mean new in the fact that it is now internally possessed by those who have come by faith through grace. And although it's new in its possession, it is not eschatologically unfamiliar because this is the reality that was always looked to. This is what God had anticipated when he subjected an entire creation to its own vanity. So it was, although it is presently now, and that's what Paul's saying, guys, this is now the actual possession of your soul if you are in Christ Jesus. If the spirit of Christ lives in you, this is your possession. This is true with regard to your soul. And then he's showing them, guys, this is not something unfamiliar to God. This is not something unfamiliar to the scripture at all. This is the eschatological intention of God for your soul. This is what God intended. Salvation is a conclusive possession, meaning it is the possessing of the conclusion to which everything points. It is a divinely orchestrated end bestowed to those in whom Christ abides. Don't lose sight of this. Everything that Paul is saying, both personally with himself and corporately as to the church who he's Speaking to the body of Christ, it rests solely upon one eternal basis. One eternal basis. Christ in you. Christ having come to dwell in the soul as the true intention of God from the beginning. Now, he's merely presenting this as a fulfilled condition. God has not lied to us, that God has not been slack concerning his promise, and he is not still waiting to fulfill his own expectation or to bring his own heart pleasure because it is done in his son. That's the reality he's addressing. So when we read the statement, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. First, we have to understand we're talking about the soul when we're talking about us. Our spirit, if you look it up, it's the rational soul. It is not the, you know, man's spirit, the human spirit that, you know, that's not what he's addressing here. We don't have time to go into the whole idea about the human spirit versus the soul. Just just bear with me and, and just take right now on the face. He's talking about the soul. It's about him bringing into the soul a confirming, con a confirmation of something that is present, something that is real, something that has been uh, brought about by a spiritual and divine transaction of God himself, not by our works or efforts, but a gift of God wrought or as Galatians 4 has said, imputed to the soul that had no ability, no sufficiency on its own 
no active means to achieve or attain what God had to do on his own by his power. This is what he's talking about. Now, as we look at these words, the, the spirit, that's that spirit of adoption. That's the spirit of life. That's the true spirit that is abiding in us, that that spirit bears witness with our spirit. There's, here's the ongoing working of the spirit within us to bear witness with our spirit that we are the children or sons of God. Now, here's the thing. I'll just point to this. The sons of God, that all the creature that was subjected to its own vanity has been waiting on. Those who were manifested to be the sons of God. I want you to catch this. Please understand. We are not still waiting and the creature or the planet Earth and all of the the, the trees and the clouds and, you know, I've heard it preached that we have all of these hurricanes and the uh, uh, natural disasters that are happening because creation is still groaning and still waiting for these manifestations of the sons of God. And guess what? I'm the son they're waiting on. We're the sons they're waiting on. How, how convenient and how egotistical. What they've all been waiting on is me. I thought they were all waiting on the Messiah, but I, I may be wrong. Yes, they've been waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God, but Paul is telling them, you are the sons of God they've been waiting on. And why? Because the whole reality of being the sons of God had nothing to do with the sons, plural. It had to do with those who finally... The thing that brought that time where they were subject to vanity, go back to Galatians 3 and 4, what we talked about. The thing that could bring them from the time or the age in which they were subject to their own vanity was this moment where there could be the manifestation of sons, or there would be those who could actually partake of the reality that that subjection was waiting on that the law pointed to, and that is Christ in you. And that is why the Spirit has to bear witness within us that this sonship is actually real and actually presently happening. Are you still going to be waiting on something to happen externally? Or the fact that the sons of God that were expected was a moment in time where there would be souls that would receive within what God pointed to without. What God pointed to with pictures and testimonies and types and shadows would be partaken of in spirit and truth, in reality, internally. That's what it all was about. That's the whole expectation was Christ living in, being in us the righteousness of the law fulfilled, the righteousness that the vanity of creation would not permit or kept man away from, kept the door closed to such reality because it was not possible. They were waiting on the moment in time where those who would believe by faith, could receive the end of the law, which is righteousness. The end, the end of the testimony, which was Christ himself. We'll get into that more, but that's exactly what this is talking about. But what Paul is showing them is, guys, this has to be first internally confirmed within those who have received such a sonship that have received the spirit of the son crying, Abba, Father, or else we're still going to be in the same boat as these people still waiting on. 
when we have received it. Now, let's note here something important. When we read in the Gospels where Jesus speaks of the Father bearing witness of him, there's a phrase, he says, the Father beareth witness of me. In those instances, the same word that is used here in Romans isn't used. The same root word is used, but in Romans 8, Paul uses a compound word in the Greek to make a very important point concerning the Spirit's witness in the soul of a believer. That is distinct from the witness God bore of his son with regard to Jesus. <clears throat> in the places used by Jesus in the gospel, <coughs> Excuse me. Apologies. He uses the word, and in the Strong's Concordance, it's 3140, martureo, and it is uh, from 3144. It is to be a witness or to testify of, to give, uh, to bear record, to give a report, to give witness. Now, this is a testimony given concerning someone. <laughs> and he gives this report not to Christ, not within Christ, but he is he gives it of Christ. He bears witness of his son. Because Christ was fully aware. Jesus was fully aware of himself, of his standing with the Father. He knew they were one in kind, in essence, in consciousness, in awareness, in spirit. He, he, they were one. And he knew that. This was not something God had to bear witness with regard to him. Even in the, if you read it in Mark, you will see, even on the day of his baptism, God is not speaking directly to Jesus. He is declaring <coughs> concerning Jesus, this is the beloved whom I have been pleased with. This is him. He declares his son in a beautiful way. Now, when Paul speaks of it concerning the witness that is being born within the soul of the believer, he utilizes the word simmartereo, which is 4828 in Strong's. It's a compound of 3140, which we read just a moment ago, and 4862, which is the word sin or with. The word there, it means to testify jointly or to corroborate by concurrent evidence. The Loanida lexicon says it is to support by testimony to provide supporting evidence and testify in conjunction with or support of. This is important. It's a distinct word used here with regard to the bearing witness of the spirit in the soul of the believer due to one thing, and that is the need of the soul to have such evidence wrought within it. First, wrought within it by the presence of Christ, which has ushered in an all new state of being, a brand new condition of completion of a righteousness that is perfect, a salvation that is undefiled. Then the Spirit's work is to bring the supporting evidence, to give corroborating evidence to the soul in which such a reality exists to assure that soul by confirming in that soul the reality of a fulfilled condition so that that soul may rest and be tranquilized or live in the tranquility of the sufficiency of a once and for all divine act of God by grace. It is a soul coming to a cognizant awareness 
of a sufficient reality wrought of God by his grace so that that soul may live in repose and rest in the sufficiency of the one who has made it so and who abides within us as the substance and substantiation of it. Being the children of God, being sons of God, is not dependent on anything other than being indwelt by or born of the Son himself. It is not a subsequent work due to sufficient efforts on our part to qualify for that title. So the Spirit of God who knows that such a state actually exists because he is called the spirit of truth. Why is that? Because he is the spirit of the truth himself and he works, he works upon the basis of the truth. He doesn't work upon the basis of some progressive thing until we get to truth. He works upon the basis of a concrete and sure, fixed truth, Christ within. He takes of Christ, shows it unto us, but he does it within us. He does so, so within. And he who knows that such a state exists as a continuation, as a constant, having first established such a witness by his presence, now brings our soul into a state of corresponding agreement by causing the heart to know, to comprehend the evidence, the eternal evidence upon which God looks to prove the true validity and security of our soul's relationship with himself. He doesn't look on the outside. Remember, God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the heart. That's so much more true with regard to this salvation we're addressing. Looks on the heart. Remember, he'd say to, to Israel in the Old Testament, he would have the prophet say to them, with your mouth, you utter these great words and you worship me with your mouth, but your heart. It's far from me. He's not just saying you're a bunch of indifferent people that give me a lip service. That may have been true. But what he is actually, the, the true de declaration was, your heart is what I'm after. These external things that do not please me, your sacrifices and your offerings and your circumcisions and your feasts and your eat this, don't eat this, all of those things they give me no pleasure, meaning I can't say of them, in this I am well pleased. Because the thing I'm after is for that which I am truly pleased with, that conclusive thing that I am after, that that be in your heart not just on your tongue. And the only moment that that could happen is when the sons of God, or let's say it this way, when the soul became by the grace of God partakers of the Son himself. The substance unto which the whole thing points. And in this bearing witness with our soul, he truly gives to the soul the evidence. He doesn't make it so. He, cut, he, he brings into our soul the assuring evidence, the amen. He reveals the anchor that holds us. And in so doing, seeing that one that God himself beholds, the one who validates everything in the sight of God. That's the whole purpose for the high priest going in and appearing without 
the, the Holy of Holies to the people. He had to show himself to them so that they could see what God beheld in the holiest of all. When they saw him, they saw themselves bound to him with the breastplate and the stones on his shoulders. They saw. But they were found in him having nothing of their own. But when God saw that man, their security was not dependent on him wearing them. Their security was dependent upon the singularity of that one standing perfect and holy before him. And when they saw him, they saw their salvation. They beheld the reality God beheld. They beheld the assurance of heaven. And their souls lived in that assurance, that certainty, that security. for a whole year as far as the type and shadow. That is, we'll get into it as we go, but that's why Paul will go on and say there's a hope that is seen. There's a hope that is not seen. If a hope is seen, why do we yet hope for it as if it's something yet to happen or something still to come or something yet to be achieved or accomplished or provided? He's talking about that hope upon which God based everything and in which God subjected an entire creation being realized in Christ who is in us. And he's, re he's declaring the necessity of that one being seen. Why? So that our soul will live in the certainty of something that is already certain. That our soul will have corresponding proof, evidence, that such is the case. That there is a relationship with God that is based sol solely upon one in us crying, Abba, Father, and not in us. Not in ourselves. Now, I want to read a couple of commentaries here, and I, I know I'm getting close to time here, I think, but anyway. I'm going to read a couple of things here from the... Uh, different word studies and commentaries and, and just show you that I'm not just throwing this out there. Uh, Alfred's notes is helpful. This is from the Weiss word study. He says, what is this witness of the spirit? All have agreed. And indeed this verse is a decisive uh, proof. It's, it is something separate from and higher than all subjective conclusions and inferences on the other hand it does not consist in mere indefinite feelings it is in a certitude of the spirit's presence and work continually within us john gill now notice what john gill says because we're going to read a lot from uh, john gill here in this class John Gill was a theologian, um, I think in the 1800s, early, I think it was in the 1800s, and a Baptist pastor. Now this witness, this is his commentary, this witness of the Spirit is, listen to this, to establish and confirm, not to make the thing itself surer, that's important. This confirming that comes by the work of the Spirit in the soul is not to make the thing he's confirming sure. It is to bring my soul to the awareness of the sureness of the thing. To show how sure this salvation is. 
to show how real it is, to show how absolutely unbreakable this thing truly is, how sure and fixed it really is. How does he do that? He reveals the son. He shows the soul, the one who makes it so and concretely makes it so, so that it is unchangeable in any way. So it, this spirit's witness in us is to confirm it, not to make the thing more sure. For that stands, the sureness of it stands on the foundation of predestination that is being found in him on the unalterable covenant of grace and a union with Christ, redemption through him, the gift of Christ and the continuance of the spirit. That's his abiding presence. That's what makes the thing sure. This confirmation just opens our soul's faculties to behold the one who makes it sure. And you don't see yourself. And you don't see how far away from that you fall because in him, you don't fall short. We all fell short in, of the glory of God in, in sin when we were in Adam, but in Christ, there's no falling short. You have, you've come to the mark. You don't miss it. God didn't throw, them, throw you at the mark. He brought the mark into you. He didn't throw you at a target and see if you hit it. No, the target, the bullseye that the whole thing was aiming toward comes into your soul. This is, this is true. He confirms this reality by showing us the one who makes it reality. Let me show you something, and I don't have this in my notes. I wrote it in earlier, and I didn't deal with this in any other time, but I have dealt with this before in classes. I think we dealt with it in the Known of God classes that we're putting up on the uh, podcast. But let me show you this. This is right after right after the rebellion of Korah and the other 250 people, or we could say priesthood, but the Korah and those who rebelled with Korah, right after they had been swallowed up by the earth and, you know, that, that judgment of God came, people were afraid and all of that. And God basically revealed that only one would stand before him and not 250 men were capable of standing before him. No matter how impressive that looked, God was impressed with one that he had chosen, a relationship that he had set in their midst. Refer this back, crying out a father. There was a relationship that God had set in their midst, personified by two men, Moses and Aaron. And yet they rebelled against it because they wanted a relationship with God of their own. They believed that they were just as holy as Moses and Aaron. They believed that they had every right to stand in the presence of God, just like Aaron, but God proved them wrong. And God made known really fast who he chose to stand before him, the one in whom they would be accepted and in no other way. So he did what he did to, to Korah. And then Aaron eventually had to stand in between the living and the dead, showing Christ as the dividing line between the living and the dead. I am the living one, those who are found in me. Then Verse, uh, chapter 17 of Numbers. That was that all happened in chapter 16 of Numbers. Now Numbers chapter 17 says, God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, 12 rods, write every man's name upon his rod. So they'd have 12 rods and the, the, the head of that, family, you know, they would write that name of the tribe, the head of that family. 
So every man's name was upon his own rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, the priesthood. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their father. So every rod represented the house. Hold. So you had that. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. You put them in the holiest of all. It shall come to pass that the man's rod, listen to these words, whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake to the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each piece one, for each prince one according to their father's house even 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. Moses laid up the rod before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness, and it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept. Listen to this. To be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quiet, quite take away their murmuring from me that they die not. You see that? First of all, they looked and they saw all of the rods. And guess what they saw? They saw that all of the rods remained a stick except one. Moses brought this out to show them one thing. He confirmed God's choice. He confirmed the one that God said, he will stand before me and no other. He will confirm my relationship with him. No other. That's, that's what this is. It's the confirmation of it so that they won't murmur, so that they won't say, what about me? So they won't say, I can do it too. So they won't say, I can stand before God just as him. No, you can't. And that's the sad part with the way we present the gospel and the natural mind that has spiritual ambition. It is always that fight. That is why this true bearing witness of the spirit has to happen. Because it, it is to show you the one that has blossomed, bloomed, and borne fruit in the sight of God. It is to show you the one that he already looks to, to verify and validate your soul's relationship with him. So that your soul or your eye won't look elsewhere to find such validation. And where do we look? Ourselves, our actions, our religious works and zeal. No. God wants to show you the evidence that he looks to. The evidence that in his very sight confirms a fixed condition. Please understand. I speak the way I do in these sessions, in every session I have. I, the, the, the Spirit of God has worked in my heart to speak this way. To assure you of the certainty of your soul's condition, your soul's state of being in Christ by new birth. Because I understand, I know the torment. The torment of living with a false expectation. The torment of hearing a specific thing preached and in so 
or based upon that having uncorroborated proof. No evidence. See, I think we should have the, the substance of the gospel presented to present us the truth or the evidence, the reality. I'm telling you, God has to bear witness with your spirit that it is true. God has to bear witness with your soul that you are a son of God, that you are in Christ, that you are born from above, that you are complete in him, that you are found in him having nothing of your own. But you have everything because he has, he has done the work and he has wrought such a finished work in your soul. He must show you that because we can be possessors of all things. We can have within us the very substance of a perfect salvation and still live ignorant because we're, we're still looking at false evidence. And every evidence that you think you're looking at that's not his face, is false evidence because false evidence will have you falling short you either self-righteous because you believe and assume you have attained to something or condemned because you realize there's no possible way that is why the work of the Spirit has to happen to bring our souls into a corresponding agreement with the Spirit who knows reality. That is why the scripture that goes, if your heart condemns you, God is, God is greater than your heart. If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. What does that mean? If your heart condemns you because your heart is still ignorant of a truth that God has wrought such a perfect work, then guess what? God is greater than your heart. God knows something your heart is still ignorant of. Therefore, he who knows these things, who searches these depths that are unsearchable to man, is the only one that can actually confirm it in our hearts. He confirms within us what he's already wrought within us. What a beautiful thing. Salvation is not about us being clean and perfect and squeaky clean human beings. It has always been about being found in him, having nothing of our own. It's about those who now partake of a vineyard or eat the fruit of a vineyard that we did not plant and live in the home or the abiding place that we did not build. It's being able to live in rest and in the ability to boast in a reality that our hand did not create. That was 1 Corinthians talks about, that we would boast in the Lord, not in ourselves, but in the Lord who has wrought this, who has made Christ to be. Un that's, that's when we're truly knowing the rest that we have come to, the Sabbath that we are in. When we can boast in glory in a work that our hands did not perform. Now, let me continue with John Gill. It is not it is not to make the thing sure, but to confirm. It is to assure us of it and of our interest in it. For the witness is given to our spirit or to our soul 
for our soul is not a witness to itself. Meaning our soul knows nothing of this condition, understands, has no true evidence of it unless the Spirit of God imposes his understanding in it. That's why it's growing in grace and knowledge. But it's the knowledge of the Lord we're growing. It's his knowledge that we grow. And in this I hear that we may, the Spirit of God has given to us that we may know the things that have been graciously bestowed unto us in Christ. What is it that we are knowing by the Spirit? What is it that the Spirit of God bears witness to show us internally? What God promised, what God prepared, what God has provided to us who believe. Him being made unto us all things, a righteousness not dependent upon our effort, but established in the living presence of Christ. John Gill goes on, to which it is made not to their ears, for it is not an audible witness, to their heart it is internal to their renewed souls where faith is wrought to receive and to their understanding that they may know and be assured of it to their spirit that are faint and doubt without it now it is the spirit itself that bears this witness and not others or by others no man can teach you this he himself in his person, who is a divine witness, whose testimony must be greater than our own, and a faithful one at that, who will never deceive, for he witnesses what he knows and what is sure and certain. His very being and habitation in the saints are witnesses and proofs of their adoption. You didn't see that? His very being and habitation in the saints is witness of their adoption. It is the evidence born indeed by the Spirit, but it is the evidence born not only to our soul, but through it and with it. The testimony is one. This is from, uh, I think, Alexander McLaurin, his commentary. And I wrote here, I'm going to read you some of the stuff here I wrote. Please understand this fact of spiritual life. The witness that brings such trans tranquility does not belong to ourselves. We do not rest after sufficient actions which have acquired a sure state of being. We do not produce it, or, nor is it our duty to search it out with multiple means and methods. The Spirit is the fountainhead of this assuring and confirming witness, and our souls are co-witnesses in that they are made to understand that which the Spirit alone knows to be so within us. We are caused to know that which only the Spirit can search out, and he does this within, because that is where all opposing concepts are formed. When the reality of such familial relationships due to his presence is not mutually realized by the Spirit's confirmation, we will, while possessing the fullness of all spiritual things, endeavor to inv instigate external means to produce tangible proof that we are who we are, that we actually are the sons of God, that we actually are the children of God, that we actually are what the Scriptures say. There is no external proof to that. There is only an internal proof, and only the Spirit of God can bring that evidence. It is the Spirit who brings such confirming or such confirmation to our souls by sharing this single witness. Paul's desires that those in Christ to whom he is writing will not foolishly live live as he did while under the law, that they will live in the full enjoyment of the new man to whom their souls has been married, to find in that man the full provision and performance of all that the law merely promised, that the reality of not I but Christ liveth in me, 
and the fulfilled righteousness that such a state ensures will not merely be the understanding of God's spirit, but will be mutually comprehended by the souls in which he abides as the teacher. This is from, uh, again, Alexander McLaurin, and I'll stop here. Well, let me, let me read this again. This is from John Gill once again. I wrote here, so many still teeter and vacillate on this matter. Many still live as if this is a witness originated by us. But listen to John Gill once again. This witness of the Spirit is to confirm not to make the thing itself surer, for that stands on the sure foundation of predestination, on the unalterable covenant of grace, on union to Christ, on redemption by him, the gift of Christ, and the continuance of the Spirit. It assures them of reality and of their own interest in it, for the testimony is given to our spirit, for our own spirits are no witness to ourselves. The Father and Son are co-witnesses of the Spirit, but not our own souls. The spirits of the saints or the souls of the saints are they which receive, see that, the receive, wrought of God, received by us. We receive the witness of the Spirit. Alexander McLaurin, and this will be my final read here. In the other case, we are admitted into this wide place that all which is our own is done and not first, and that the true basis of all our confidence lies not in the thought of what we are or what we feel toward God, but in the thought of what God is and his feeling toward us. This is knowing as we are known. Not that we have known, but that we are known. Instead, therefore, of being left to labor for ourselves, painfully to search amongst the dust and the rubbish of our own hearts, we are taught to sweep away all of the crumbled, rotten surface and to go down to the true living rock that lies beneath it all. We are taught to say, in the words of the book of Isaiah, Doubtless thou art our father. We are all an unclean thing. Our iniquities like the wind have carried us away. And there is nothing that is stable in us. See, we need to stop looking for stability where it never is found. And realize that there has been a stability provided that is found in him, having nothing of our own. Not I, but Christ is the greatest stability that there could ever exist. And it is a gift that has been given in perfect, in perfect measure by the grace of God. There is nothing stable in us, in our own resolutions. They are swept away like the chaff of the summer threshing floor by the first gust of temptation. But what of that? In those is continuance, and we are being saved. Brethren, expand this thought of the conviction that God is my Father as being the basis of all my confidence that I am his child into its wild, wildest and grandest form. And it leads us up to the blessed conviction. I am nothing. My holiness is nothing. My resolutions are nothing. My faith, nothing. My energies are nothing. I stand stripped, barren, naked of everything, and I fling myself out of myself onto the merciful arms of my Father in heaven. There it is. Always weak and always dependent upon the sufficiency of him. When we are weak, we are still strong because the strength of another undergirds us and overrides us. That is our great salvation. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. There is all the difference in the world between searching for the evidence of our sonship. That's what most people are yet doing. And we're always coming short, so we'll always look for another way. Always look for another method, another means. And we wear ourselves out 
and we get burned out. You know a Christian is burned out? Maybe you are one. Christian burnout shouldn't be a thing. Because when you come into Christ, you come into rest. You come into the Sabbath himself. There is all the difference in the world between searching for the evidence of our sonship and seeking to get the conviction of God's fatherhood. How does he do that? He shows you the son in whom he is well pleased. He shows you the beloved in whom you are accepted. He shows you the one that cries, Abba, Father, in your soul. He doesn't give you a gold ribbon or a star because you finally achieved sonship. Now the evidence is finally there. The proof is finally raw. No. Proof was wrought when he came to abide in your soul. Now the spirit's work is to bear witness of that proof by showing you that evidence, showing you that proof in the face of Jesus Christ. The one looking for our sonship is an endless, profitless, self-tormenting task. The other looking God's fatherhood is the light and liberty, the glorious liberty of the children of God. It is this reality upon which the spirit of truth works, and it is this sufficient work that he bears witness to in our soul by making known this concrete, unmovable rock, showing us a foundation that is unmoved showing us an anchor that is yet holding by showing us the Son who abides forever, faithful and true. I hope this has helped. I trust it has. I pray that the Spirit of God will use it at least that we may know you, Lord, we may know. May we continually yield our hearts and set our affection upon this glorious work of the Spirit to bear witness with us, our soul, within us, to show the corresponding proof that we are the sons of God, to show the true evidence that we are pass from death unto life. That we are brought from sin and the bondage of sin to righteousness. So, thanks for listening, guys. I, I certainly appreciate it. And if you have any comments, questions, you can email me, ravenbird, R-A-B-O-N-B-Y-R-D at gmail.com and uh, hopefully we can uh, start a conversation. I'm always looking forward to that, being able to converse with you, talk to you in whatever way possible. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Um, we'll, we'll stop there. Amen.